welcome. All 23,000 of you welcome. Through a global pandemic, war, unrest, you still made the choice to attend this conference and to further your accessibility learnings. So for that, again, I say thank you. In fact, in just the second year, you have helped to make AxCon the largest accessibility conference in the world. Here at AxCon, we hope to help you know today a little bit more about digital accessibility than you did yesterday and lessen the burden of making it so. It always surprises me how far those th two things put together can get you. Um, so with that said, I guess what I'm going to um, really get into is what we've seen over the years is a significant increase in the number of the ADA lawsuits relating to digital accessibility, website and mobile accessibility, that is. You know, while personally, I think that may be seen as a little unfortunate, perhaps this was the only way that the accessibility advocacy groups felt they would not be shut out of knowledge, education, employment, voting, life in general, as things move more and more online. I firmly and deeply believe that dev teams across the world want to do the right thing. They simply have not had the way, uh, easy way to do it. And slowing down velocity meant getting eaten for lunch, frankly, right? So we released AxCore in 2015 to help uh, the dev teams really make it, make it a, not a choice between high velocity and doing the right thing. We wanted to provide transparency to accessibility testing rules, to consider accessibility as code was being created rather than get a mountain of reports after the fact and remove all barriers to making digital accessibility happen and getting it going. The steep adoption of Axe Core is a testimonial of how given the tools, all of us want to do the right thing. And with, you know, when we first launched Axe Core, uh, we thought, okay, well, maybe we'll get developers to embrace it. Maybe we'll build a community around it. In 2017, we had 1 million downloads and we thought, hmm, that's very good. Developers are embracing it. In 2021, at the end of 2021, we crossed 300 million downloads and we thought, you know what? Maybe this is taking hold. Fast forward to March of 2022, as we sit here today, and we have close to half a billion downloads. And that really means that you developers and dev teams across this world are embracing digital accessibility. And we hope with AxCon, we're going to help you go further, faster. That's what this conference is all about. So a little bit more about AxCon. We believe the path to sustainable accessibility is by making it an accepted part of the digital development process. This means doing accessibility all the time, conceiving of accessible experiences, implementing those, and then of course, testing and making sure the quality of those accessible experiences is what they should be. So what we did was we organized AxCon into four tracks. One, for designers, because we believe designers of this world can really, really make a very big difference to accessible user interfaces. And they don't have to make it so that, um, you know, the, the chasm between developers and designers that has been historically true exists. Accessibility can be bridged between the two. And the second track for developers, and when I say developers, I don't mean just the people who do the coding, although you guys, of course, like I said, rubber is where, it, you know, the rubber meets the code, that's where it's at. Uh, but developers includes all dev teams, whether you are product owners, product managers, whether you're testers, or whether you're the coders and developers. 
this track will get you a lot of sessions that we hope will be valuable for the dev teams. The next track is for organizational success. Accessibility, digital accessibility is a very cross-cutting uh, culture change we have found. It impacts every part of the organization and perhaps uh, only second to security, or maybe not even second, maybe even more than security will encompass all parts of your organization. So for setting up your organization to be able to be successful with accessibility, we have a track dedicated to that called organizational success. And then we have a wild card really focusing on, well, everything else. Now, 60% of you here today are new to AxCon and new to DQ. Welcome. If you're new to accessibility too, we hope your journey will be as fulfilling as it has been for us. 23,000 of you have chosen to do this. And the theme for today's, this year's AxCon is high velocity accessibility. We believe it is necessary to allow all digital experiences to be made and kept accessible to have high velocity accessibility. Um, so a little bit of history for those of you who are new to digital accessibility. Uh, digital accessibility is celebrating its 50th birthday, woohoo. And although we've only seen dramatic changes in adoption over the last few years, a very quick tour through the last 50 years. In 1972, uh, last year's inaugural AxCon keynote speaker, Wind Surf, actually started the movement. And he did this in order to communicate with his wife, who happened to be deaf. Fast forward to the next decade in the 1980s, Jim Thatcher, who was my mentor, invented the first screen reader for users who were blind. And then we saw uh, picture-based keyboards become prevalent in uh, <clears throat> stores. And this was to help people who did not have speech. In 1990s, we had the Breakthrough American with Disabilities Act pass, which made discriminating against people with disabilities against the law, right? And in 1995, you know, with the advent of the graphical user interface, which actually made digital accessibility a little bit tougher than command line, of course, um, Microsoft did something incredible. They made accessibility, they built in accessibility into their operating system. Uh, and they were the first operating system to have accessibility features built in. But it wasn't until 20 some years ago in 1998, when web accessibility actually came into the picture. And in 1998, we had the section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act which said that anybody selling information technology to the federal government in the United States and the federal agencies building stuff had to make it accessible. Um, in 1999, the World Wide Web Consortium, the people who make all the standards for the web, realized digital accessibility is going to be a thing. And they've released, and they've been working on this for a while, but they wanted to make sure that what it means to be accessible for the web, there is no debate and it can be trusted and they've released the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 1.0. Oh. Uh, web AIM, an organization dedicated to making accessibility knowledge um, happen, was launched the same year. It was a very eventful decade. Now, in 2000s, uh, a couple of companies thought, hmm, we should make accessibility testing happen, and DQ was one of them, and we launched our desktop product called Ramp uh, and tried to really make accessibility testing happen. Um, in 2004, uh, I realized that, you know what, we have to be able to do this at scale, especially with the federal government uh, having millions of web pages, and we launched the first enterprise scanning tool aligned with the way the web content was being published at that time through content management systems. Um, 
In 2005, um, I realized that PDF was also going to be a challenge and we created a PDF converter to HTML. Um, this was called Undock, but it, the, the pivotal thing that happened there is Adobe realized that PDFs had to be accessible and built it into their platform. Now, in 2006, there was a very a great turning point again, where NFP actually uh, won a lawsuit against Target that mandated Target make its digital experiences and retail experience accessible to the world, um, which really started the whole flurry of lawsuits. But more than that, I think it made people realize that beautiful looking websites can be made accessible and complex retail sites can be made accessible. In 2008, WorkAG 2.0, WorkAG, meaning Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 was released and DQ's tools became the first in the industry to support that guideline. Then in 2010, we launched the first tool uh, to really help developers by building it into uh, the, the browser extension. We also realized very soon that you know, web content accessibility guidelines, wonderful as they are, were very difficult to digest because they were a standard. And we launched DQ University in 2014 to make accessibility knowledge digestible and bite-sized. In 2014, the Industry of Accessibility Professionals was launched, Association of Accessibility Professionals was launched, and we were the founding member of that, which made accessibility a real career. In 2015, we open sourced the Axe Rule Engine, the what this conference is named after, and made it open source. So Axe was born in 2015. Um, then we started to see more and more of native mobile accessibility become an issue while native mobile applications were proliferating our lives. So we launched the first set of native mobile tools. In 2018, another uh, web content accessibility guideline uh, you know, was published. The standards were published 2.1, which was very important because for the first time it included people with, disab uh, with cognitive disabilities. And um, once again, DQ was the first to support the web content accessibility guidelines 2.1. In 2019, we saw agile development take hold and the trend towards automated testing and release the first suite of products to address this so you could build in automated um, testing for accessibility into your unit tests, into your end-to-end -end tests, into your regression test suites, and you could do it as you code looking into the browser extension. We did all of that in um, 2019, not too long ago, but uh, integrated into how developers work. Um, then in 2021, Fast forward to this decade, as the pandemic happened, we wanted to make accessibility accessible. And we launched AxCon the, in 2021 as a virtual event. And now fast forward to this year in 2022, we've launched this you know, second year of AxCon where all of us are gathered. Uh, we've launched a static code linter so you can prevent some big defects as you code, basically get accessibility for free. And with over 23,000 of you uh, registering to further digital accessibility, I say enough about history. Let me hand over to you, Dylan, to talk about the gains of 2021 and the amazing stuff you will learn about during AxCon. Over to you. Thank you, Preeti. Well, uh, welcome everybody from all over the world. We've got 23,000 of you here. That's fantastic. What a year it has been. And with everything going on in the world, it really reminds me of the Dickens novel, A Tale of Two City Cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Because 2021 was a, a difficult year, but it was actually a great year for everything related to Axe. Um, at the last AxCon, as pre mentioned, we were really happy because we report that AxCore was being downloaded 5 million times a week. And now <clears throat> we're even happier because we're almost at 9 million downloads a week. 
That's an 80% increase year over year. There are now 1.6 million projects on GitHub that use AxeCore with 699 packages on GitHub that include it. And on NPM, the number of published modules using AxeCore has grown by 30% over the year. Um, as Preeti mentioned, last AxeCon, we announced the release of our new VS Code linter extension. And this year, we're very happy to announce that it's the most downloaded accessibility linter extension for VS Code with over 30,000 users and counting. Which brings us to about half a million extension users uh, using Axe-related extensions that DQ has developed every week. Uh, that's a combination of people using our browser, different browser extensions and uh, uh, editor extensions and et cetera. Also last year at AxeCon, we announced the release of Axe DevTools Pro. And today we have thousands of users using it every day, achieving an automation rate of greater than 80% for web content. Now this is truly high velocity accessibility. When you can find over 80% of your defects with little to no knowledge of accessibility and instantaneously also find suggestions and information on how to remediate issues. Just last week, I was on a call with a financial services customer and they told me that Axe DevTools Pro had cut down the time it takes them to generate their VPATs by 50%. Not only that, it also allowed them to communicate for the first time the real impact to the business stakeholders in a way that was previously not possible. And they were able to pull all this information out of the publicly available um, uh, information that's, that's part of the Axe ecosystem. So our, our uh, uh, how, to, how to, uh, fix and our, our information on the rules, et cetera. And all of the features that they're using today to achieve this were developed and released within the last year. Uh, the number of projects, projects, uh, products and integrations that use AxeCore has grown significantly over the year to the point where quite simply I've stopped counting. It's just too many <laughs> to keep track of. Um, and this year has also seen the increase in the utilization of artificial intelligence and machine learning to push the boundaries of what both assistive technology can do and what we can do to help development teams produce accessible digital experiences. Last week, we announced our most recent enhancement to Axe DevTools Pro that uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to empower the developer, tester, and designer. And we believe this is the right approach for levering this, uh, leveraging this powerful technology and will continue to push the boundaries over the coming year, using technology to empower the user to high velocity accessibility. And so while we're proud over the last year to have helped make COVID-19 related sites and applications accessible, it's unfortunate that the progress often still followed on from an initial failure, driving up the costs for people with disabilities and the organizations provide, providing services alike. So we still have significant work to do. So we continue to roll up our sleeves. We're focused on expanding the reach of accessibility, further shifting left and shifting right when needed, end-to-end -end coverage of the DevOps process. Last year, we focused a lot of our attention on security. We've invested in making AxeCore and any product that uses it, even those of DQ's competition, the most secure accessible testing tools, while maintaining full support for all HTML features such as cross-domain iframes and shadow DOM. Our capabilities in this regard are unrivaled. The number of contributors has also continued to grow, a testament to this vibrant community. I mean, there's 23,000 of you here uh, this year. That's crazy. Uh, that's amazing. There are 31% more Axe Core contributors this year than there were last year. While the Axe Core manifesto means that we focus on quality and zero false positives, we've also added five new rules this year while improving the quality of many of the existing ones. Broad usage of our tools and adoption by organizations means that we are able to uh, push the boundaries of the technology. And, and uh, last year, we found some areas where performance could be improved by over a hundredfold. Talk about high vol velocity accessibility again. As I said earlier, we released Axlint to VS Code plugin last year and have been working on expanding its usability and utility. We added comprehensive Angular support and significantly enhance the rules over the course of the year. And now we bring that Axe Core compatible capability to your CI CD and Git process with the release of the Axe Linter server. Axe Linter can now be embedded into your pre commit hooks, your GitHub actions, your CI CD processes, and even into places we cannot imagine through the use of our REST API for linting. Please attend the What's New in Axe Core session Wednesday, 
10 a.m. Eastern time, where AxCore contributors will go into details about recent and upcoming improvements, including the Linter server I just mentioned. Last year, we announced Ax DevTools Pro, and we also announced that it significantly increased the coverage of automation-assisted analysis. But the technology was new, and we did not yet have enough real-world data to back up our assertion. That has now changed, and we've confirmed through a comprehensive study that Ax DevTools Pro does in fact find over 80% of the accessibility issues commonly reported in comprehensive manual assessments. If this interests you, please attend the presentation today at 3 p.m. Eastern time, where Glenda Sims and Jason Wilson will go into this in detail. I mentioned earlier the story about how one customer had reduced their VPAT production time by 50% with Axe DevTools Pro. To see all the new features that can help you achieve similar increases in your velocity, please attend the session on Thursday, 11 a.m., where Preeti Kumar and Harris Schneiderman will give you detailed information on the power of Axe DevTools Pro. All of these great advances in HTML accessibility, but what about mobile? Axe DevTools Mobile is the first and currently only tool that supports automated analysis of Swift UI on iOS and Jetpack Compose on Android. This is a great demonstration of our commitment to supporting the development of all digital experiences and being the first and most comprehensive set of tools for mobile accessibility testing. In his presentation at 3 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, Devanshu Chandra will be showing the Jetpack Compose capabilities. And immediately after that, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, Kate Owens will be showing the Swift UI capabilities. So what does the future bring for Axe? This is one area where I'm afraid there will be little change in the coming year. We will continue building on the solid foundation in the three directions we, we, we said to you last year. Firstly, making things easier for development teams by expanding the coverage we can provide through automation, through machine learning, guided testing, and heuristics. Secondly, reducing the barriers to adoption through more and simpler integrations, like our Axe server, for example. And thirdly, covering more of your digital footprint by supporting more platforms, technologies, and new ways of working, like we did this year with SwiftUI and Jetpack Compose. But enough about the technology. The success of Axe Core has allowed us to leverage the Axe brand name and reputation to create this great AxCon community. And we really want AxCon to be your community and your conference. So we invite you to join us, making Axe and AxCon stronger, richer, and more diverse. And with that, uh, I'd like to hand you back to Preeti to recognize members of the community who have and who are doing amazing things to change culture, change practices, and leverage technology in the right way. Great, thanks, Dylan. You know, for me personally, for me personally, um, the accessibility journey started when I was coding in the basement in 2000 and trying to make accessibility testing, automate accessibility testing. It, and people called me crazy, but it takes a little bit of crazy, this journey does. For all the awardees, I think it's safe to assume this accessibility journey has been an adventure and crazy. So, you know what, really a hero's journey, what does it mean? What does a hero's journey mean? Heroes go out into the unknown, do something that has never been done. They go through great difficulties. They fail, they persist until they get it right. And when they reach their goal, they come back uh, and they share what they have learned with the rest of us. And really that's what makes the community stronger. So the Axe Awards is where we recognize those companies and those people who have done this. The first is the award of accessibility at scale. And this, rec this really recognizes organizations that have been able to get traction with accessibility across a very large number of teams and divisions within their organization. DQ is proud to award Adobe with the Accessibility at Scale Award for their wide-reaching and mature accessibility efforts. Adobe has done an incredible job and has a top notch of extremely experienced accessibility professionals led by Andrew Kirkpatrick, the Director of Accessibility at Adobe. 
Their team provides support throughout the design and development process to foster accessibility in a very large and complex product ecosystem, as you can imagine. So congratulations uh, to Adobe for doing accessibility at scale. The next award is uh, the Diverse Adoption Award, which is awarded to organizations that have been able to get adoption for accessibility across a large number of different formats and technologies. This award goes to user testing. Uh, kudos to user testing for their commitment to organizational change that takes a lot of drive, a lot of dedication. And user testing has proven that in 2021. Their active engagement within every level of the organization has helped drive the culture of change for long-term commitment to improving accessibility. Congratulations, user testing. The next award is for the long-standing commitment to accessibility. <clears throat> and you know, accessibility is also, uh, for short, we call it A11Y. So don't let this confuse you. What you see is the long-standing commitment award goes to Ally. Ally has done, Ally Bank has done the most amazing thing, uh, which is that they've been able to sustain their commitment to accessibility. And they've done it over a long period of time. So congratulations to Ally. The next board is the, you know, we talk about culture and culture is one of the most difficult things to uh, really, it, it's the difference between a good company and a great company, we say, right? The culture. Well, accessibility culture is very difficult. And uh, the next award is about really taking the usability and accessibility and advancing the practice of accessible in innovative ways, but making it a part of the culture. And that award goes to REI Co-op. Congratulations. I'm sure it is. it continues to be an adventure, right? The next award, the Axe Power User Award is given to organizations that have achieved wide and impactful adoption of Axe-based tools. And frankly, Workday is the most amazing organization as I see them take and proliferate Axe across their development teams. It always amazes me at how much they're getting out of it. So the Axe Popper User Award to Workday, congratulations. Uh, the next award is Commitment to Accessibility in the Public Sector. We've had administration changes. We've had a lot of things. And through it all, Mark Urban, the person who leads accessibility at CDC, has really shown how a commitment to accessibility in the public sector, especially for CDC to have done that, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention during COVID times was an incredible boon for the world. And so thank you, CDC, and you get the Commitment to Accessibility in the Public Sector Award. All right. Now, we talked about the fact that native mobile accessibility is, you know, fast changing, relatively new, and we wanted to recognize that in this really complex ecosystem of Android and iOS accessibility, it takes a lot of gumption to make that happen. And the company that made that happen, the award for native mobile accessibility goes to US Bank. And congratulations, US Bank, for really that commitment to native mobile accessibility as more and more of us go to the native mobile apps. Now, now that we're done with all the awards, and once again, congratulations to all of you as you have really come back and shared with us this hero's journey of how you've made accessibility happen in each one of your organizations. But next, we're going to introduce some really awesome individuals who were nominated for the Jim Thatcher Lifetime Achievement Award. As I said to you earlier, Jim Thatcher was my mentor and uh, this Lifetime Achievement Award means a lot to me personally. And for those of you who don't know Jim Thatcher, 
He was one of those early pioneers of web accessibility before it was even a thing. I talked about him inventing the first screen reader while he was working at IBM. But more than that, Jim was truly a remarkable and empathetic human being. He took great pride in his work and he took great pride in fostering the next generation of accessibility pioneers, as he called us. Um, in the words of a really great philanthropist, Bill Gates, I say the final step after seeing the problem is finding an approach and to measure the impact of your work and share your successes and failures so that others can learn from your efforts. Jim truly did that. And look at the impact his work continues to have. I know that he is the one who inspired me to wake up and work 20 hour days. So, you know, he has had a great impact. The Jim Thatcher Award will be chosen by you. It's a people's choice award. It's not something that DQ is going to choose really. And um, we will be sharing the URL where you can vote and help decide who receives this really awesome award. We have nominated these individuals that we're going to be just disclosing to you in a second for the broad impact that their work has had um, and for the persistence that they have shown in working for accessibility. We would like you to think of these um, people as you vote and who has had the most impact on digital equality and inclusive technology. While these are the nominees that we chose, uh, believe me, it was a gut-wrenching and heart-wrenching process to choose just four. Um, we had so many more that we could have chosen. And it's possible that all of you may think of someone else who's more deserving that we did not think of. So when you vote, we have left an option for you to write in your alternative choice, okay? And we would like to use the Axe Award um, Twitter handle um, to tell us via Twitter who you voted for and why. Again, the Twitter handle is uh, hash A-X-E-A-W-A-R-D, Axe Award. Please, only serious nominees and only individuals, okay? So without further ado, DQ's nominees for the Jim Thatcher Lifetime Award are Bryce Johnson. Bryce Johnson is somebody who actually, I think, you know, gaming for people with disabilities was not a thing. And I think Bryce Johnson did something amazing when he co-invented the Xbox adaptive controller at Microsoft because, you know, accessible IT, accessible, accessible digital equality is for everything. It's for work and it's for fun. Thank you, Bryce, for doing that. And you are one of the nominees. Next nominee, Judy Human. Judy is a lifelong, <laughs> lifelong um, disability rights activist. I used to watch her speak and get inspired. I still am. And that's the next nominee. Vote for Judy uh, for all the work that she's done. Work for Bryce for the breakthrough innovation of making gaming accessible. Next, Sina Baram. He's the founder of PAC, champion of change. Sina and I were sitting at a conference together and I remember uh, we both were very passionate about digital accessibility and we were arguing about it. And then after a long argument, we looked at each other and we said, ah, oh, we really believe in the same thing, don't we? And Sina has done some amazing things and he really truly is a champion of change. So if you want to vote for Sina, that would be terrific as well. Last but not the least, oh, the nominee for the Jim Thatcher Lifetime Award, Lainey Feingold. Lainey Feingold is a disability rights lawyer and a very good friend. Um, she started structured negotiations because she felt 
that um, you know, the fight for digital rights did not have to be combative. And she made such breakthroughs and she made so many organizations embrace digital accessibility. Again, this is a People Choice Award. We will announce this once everybody has voted, you will get to know who won the um, Jim Thatcher Lifetime Award after we actually tally up all the, um, the votes. Now, uh, before I let you go and enjoy all of the um, conference, I wanted to tell you, no matter how accessibility is part of your role at work, we hope and we think you will find something at AxCon in these four tracks uh, that will make your job easier. And we hope rather than having accessibility be a punishment because it's hard and slows you down, AxCon actually inspires you, shows you how easy, fast, and frankly, rewarding digital accessibility can be. To me, digital accessibility is actually an ode to life. The billions of different human beings out there, just like billions of stars that are different that make up the earth. And the joy of being in life with all these people, all these diverse people, is what it's about. Accessible code is coding for this diverse humanity. What a lot of good each one of us can do by, by making that happen. Think about it. All of you are amazing human beings to be here today at AxCon. I want you to go out there, make learning easy. Remember, you should know a little bit more than you did yesterday about digital accessibility, and we should make it a little bit less difficult for you to do make digital accessibility happen. I want you to have fun at AxCon. I hope to see you in many of the sessions. I'm going to be circulating. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Preeti and Dylan, for a great session. We do, we do have a lot of questions coming in, so I will dive right in. Um, also, uh, everybody who registered for AxCon uh, should be receiving that uh, Jim Thatcher Award survey. Uh, there's also a link in the Q&A if you want to click on that and vote for uh, who you think should win that award. We'd really appreciate it. But let's dive in here. Okay, um, here's a question that got a lot of upvotes earlier. Uh, what's your advice for allies to push the needle in countries where accessibility does not have a mandate? That's a great question. Um, firstly, work to make it a mandate, obviously, but that takes work, right? Um, digital equality is really the only humane thing to do. Science with humanity should be the push, right? And I would say that accessibility can happen at different levels. It can happen grassroots level. You can make it happen in your company, in your life by doing the right thing. Uh, for people with disabilities across the world, what we've done is we've made DQ University free, no charge. You can just sign up, and you get the entire curriculum. You can make sure uh, all of you people with disabilities actually are learning accessibility and spreading the word. Um, what else can you do? I, I think the United Nations is doing a lot. I think you can really have your uh, country join the United Nations um, movement for digital accessibility. But again, I think it begins with you. I love the story of this little girl, you know, she's actually taking and picking up a starfish, one starfish at a time, she's throwing it back into the ocean. And somebody asks her, what are you doing? So she says, I'm saving the starfish, one starfish at a time, make that little difference. Awesome, thank you, Pretty. 
All right, here's another one here. Um, what are your suggestions to help shift the culture of development to include accessibility from the ground up? Well, Dylan's written a book on this, so I'm going yeah. to let him weigh <laughs> into this. <laughs> I'm gonna let him, I'm going to let him weigh in, but you know what? The theme for AxCon this year is high velocity accessibility. And I really believe that if accessibility is a pain in the you know what and slows you down, it's not going to happen. And I believe, I truly sincerely believe the one thing that you can do is equip your teams with knowledge and tools so you make it less difficult. In fact, you should be getting accessibility for free with the linter as Dylan was talking about for free. All you have to do is as you code, you see stuff come up and you have to you know, pay attention. You anyway have to pay attention as you code. And um, so knowledge, make it easy for people to get the knowledge and give them the tools and get out of the way. Of course, you have to give the funding too, but yes. <laughs> Dylan, you wanna to add to that? Well, uh, the first thing you can do is attend the session tomorrow. I think it's yeah. at 10 a.m. Yeah. Eastern time tomorrow, where we're actually gonna go into this in quite a lot of detail. Um, but I think I think it's it, it, it comes down to three 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 principles really. Uh, if you're looking at the development teams themselves, the one is how do you increase understanding? Because a lot of the time, uh, what's what's stopping development teams and developers from really doing the right thing is is they don't really understand. First of all, they don't really understand people with disabilities and and the assistive technology they use and how they use those and the, and the struggles that they might have. So, so really uh, fostering that understanding opens people's eyes to what's going on and, and allows them to then start really thinking about the solutions to that. The second thing is to really enable them to deliver effectively. And Preeti talked about tools. Tools are, are, are one of the things you can do to really help them to deliver effectively. And then um, the third thing is to really support the continual improvement, whether that continual improvement uh, includes initially learning uh, so, uh, you know, giving them the right learning resources and things like coaches to help support that learning, but then also to um, help the team uh, look at itself and figure out how over time it can get better and better from initially perhaps being, you know, really with, uh, starting with the basics towards over time uh, increasing to the point where they're, they're, they're able to address all of accessibility in a, in a really comprehensive way. So those, those are the three principles and we'll go into that in a lot more detail tomorrow. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, there's also quite a few questions in here um, on Linter. Um, I know that Dylan, you mentioned there's there's several talks that will be um, talking more about uh, the available mm -hmm. Linters, at least at DQ, correct? Yeah, and now that I don't have my notes, I can't remember the exact time, but there is the what's, uh, what's new in X uh, core session, uh, yep. where they will go into the X Linter. Uh, I, I believe the session that uh, Harris and Preeti are doing, uh, Harris yes. will also be showing uh, some of the Linter functionality. Um, so there's at least those two sessions that you can go and you can see the two different ways of embedding uh, ac accessibility into your dev process and how the Linter can be used as one of the tools uh, to really facilitate that. Yeah, and my session is really going to cover the linter because, you know, remember, we think of accessibility in the development life cycle as like a multi-filtration system, which is that you catch the rocks, the big stuff in the first filter with the linter. So we're going to be covering that in my session. Then we're going to be going into catching the pebbles through automated testing and then catching the fine stuff, you know, the sand, I guess, in the multi-filtration system through the Axe DevTools browser extension using Pro. Uh, which gets you to over 80% as Glenda is going to be showing you in her session. So my session will definitely cover the winter. Awesome. Thank you both. Yeah. All right. Uh, got so many questions coming in here. I don't think we'll be able to get through them all, but let me squeeze as many as we can in. Mm -hmm. Uh, one point of clarification, somebody asked Preeti, did you mention that DQ University offers free courses? Can you speak to that really quick um, again? Of course. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is uh, make digital accessibility a career choice for people with disabilities. 
uh, so they could get well-paying jobs. And uh, so we made uh, access to DQ University, which we launched in 2014, along with that a couple of years down the line, uh, we wanted to make um, everything, all the courses available for free for people with disabilities. All you have to do is come in, I think send an email and DQ University, also dquuniversity.com has a place that you can go do that as well, dq.com, contact us form. Just have to tell us that you have a disability and you will get the content for free. Awesome. Thank you, Prady. Yeah. All right. Uh, have you seen a shift in the market during the pandemic? Um, and are organizations and people giving accessibility more priority now than before? So how has the pandemic affected? Yeah, we've seen the velocity of accessibility increase throughout. We are seeing many, many people, more people coming, knocking at our door, for sure, um, many more. And um, I, I think the pandemic made us all realize that um, our digital lives are no longer a nice to have, but a must have. I don't know, through the pandemic, I never went into a physical branch of a bank, not once. I did all my online bank, all my banking online. Now, you know, so more and more the COVID pandemic has shown us that all of Maslow's hierarchy of needs have to be met online many times. It's not a choice. So yes, we've seen great velocity. Definitely. Thank you, Preeti. All right, um, let's see here. Um, somebody was asking about uh, the percentages of the lawsuits that uh, Pretty, I believe you shared. Um, if, if it's public knowledge out there, what percentage yeah. are uh, websites uh, versus mobile? Uh, so kind of what's the split there? Are you, are you, know, you aware? I don't know the number offhand, but we can definitely get back to you with that. I think the important thing, actually, the trend that I'm seeing is that more and more, um, it's not either or. So it's not that people are, uh, companies are being sued for uh, the web. In fact, it's including both. It's including native mobile and the web, uh, which is very, I mean, that's the way it should be, because really it's you know, nobody should force you, hey, use the phone or use your laptop to go and do something. Go use an app, native mobile app, or go use a website, right? It is not a choice, and we are seeing that change. So more and more lawsuits are including both. Definitely. And we'll get you the exact number, though. Yep, we can follow up. Yeah. All right, I think we have time for, for one more question here. Uh, let's see. Any plans to further support monitoring by European governments under the EU Web Accessibility Directive? Uh, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, short answer, yeah. yes. <laughs> but longer answer is that um, just with the EU, with Australia, with all of you across the world, where monitoring for accessibility is becoming very important. And remember, the way that we code has changed, it's no longer the remember, the first monitor that we released, uh, Axe Monitor was released in 2004, 2005. In that version, it was all about static websites. So as we look into monitoring for the EU, for other countries. We've also realized that dynamic single page web, web apps are the really uh, new thing or not so new thing, but something that we need to be able to handle. And we do have a session uh, in um, AxCon for Ax Monitor, which now integrates with um, the command line interface scripting, which is a great way to actually monitor everything that you need to monitor. And yes, we will be doing more for the EU, for sure. Awesome. Thank you. All right. And with that, I think we are at time. We'd like to give uh, about 10 minutes for you to pick out your next session to join at AxCon. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you to both Preeti and Dylan 
uh, for such a great session and, and kind of kicking off uh, this AxCon 2022. Uh, and thank you all for attending. We appreciate it. And we hope you enjoy the rest of AxCon. Thank yeah, you. don't forget to have fun. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.